prayer, and then we will resume our study in the 8th chapter of the book of Daniel. Make sure the phone is silenced here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of gathering together to study your word. Help us to understand how we would apply uh, the insights of, of your holy scripture to our lives that we might uh, be effective ministers in an increasingly dark world. We thank you, Lord. We praise you that uh, you hold time in your hands, that you are outside of time, and that in your sovereignty your will will be done. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, before we jump into the scripture, I want to point out that last week, if, uh, if you had the opportunity to, well, everyone had the opportunity, if you were here to listen, but um, if you were aware of what you were listening to, last week we had, uh, inarguably, this is not even debatable, the best prelude uh, music to the worship service that you will ever hear. Um, it was outstanding. Thank you, Laura, for, for working up uh, uh, the, the prelude music. Now, that's an inside joke. Uh, because uh, I've been asking, well, since we actually came here, I don't remember what, 2017, I've been asking for a certain hymn, and Laura worked it into the, uh, worked it into the prelude music uh, last week, and, and it, w it was beautiful. Um, and, oh, it was Marching to Zion, okay, uh, which, by the way, was uh, written and composed by the same guy who did Joy to the World. Uh, which will also tell you that it's probably post-millennial in its content, and that is correct. It would be post-millennial in its content, but it's beautiful, beautiful music. So thank you, Laura, for doing that last week. Now, now to some, uh, I guess, less benign news. Last week we ended with Alexander the Great destroying the Greek city-state of Thebes. And you say, Greg, why did you read us all that stuff about you know, this slaughter, this massacre, this Grecian on Grecian violence that was going on. And, and the reason I, I, I did that, I decided to do that, is because I think we sometimes get maybe a little desensitized, if you will, to what goes on in, in history. Um, folks, this, th these, these and other times are brutal times. Okay, we read in you know our history books, and so and so conquered this, and so and so defeated so and so. Okay, and we kind of I think many times just gloss over that. Okay, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives lost in these battles, in these wars, in these campaigns. These aren't gentle diplomatic expeditions, okay? So when you see how God's perspective of these world empires are that of beasts, I think there's good cause for seeing, seeing them in terms of beasts. So where we left off, and we're going, another reason is I kind of want de to desensitize you to what's coming this week, because <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> It doesn't get better, okay? But that's what we saw in the degradation of the statue uh, that was presented to Nebuchadnezzar anyway. Uh, but I um, want to pick up again now uh, at Alexander the Great, Graham Wrightson, uh, who is a, a, a famed uh, historian, author of Combined Arms Warfare in Ancient Greece, said Alexander raised Thebes, not raised it, raised it, as in Z, okay? Just cut it down, Um raised Thebes to the ground and sold the entire city into slavery, except for one house that was owned by descendants of his favorite poet. So he played favorites, okay? And by the way, if you're keeping score at home, that poet would be Pindar, okay? One of the great lyrical Greek and Grecian poets uh, from a century prior to this, this circumstance. So he basically d took Thebes down to the dirt, okay? And then in Daniel 8, uh, verse 8 says, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. Okay, that male goat we know is the Grecian Empire. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn that was broken, that would be Alexander the Great, the large, powerful uh, 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 king was broken. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. Now we've actually seen what these four things are in a prior chapter, and we'll go into a little more detail today. 
But um, Blake, if you want to throw up the, 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 the slide here that I think just starts with Alexander, maybe. I want to, you know, because, is it up? Let me see. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk you through this really, hopefully, very quickly here, because this is, these are the campaigns of Alexander, okay? This is basically Alexander's very short life, and I wanted to do this in terms of countries uh, from modern day, if you will, so you can see where things are happening, okay? So here's Iraq, here's Iran, here's Afghanistan, here's Pakistan, uh, this would be Turkey over here. Uh, here you have, you know, the, the, the Greece, Macedonian area, you know, Bulgaria, and so on and so forth. So when it says that, that, that he went through the world not touching the ground, or as a prior uh, 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 vision said, that he had four wings, okay, and he was like a leopard. He was fast enough, but he got even faster. Listen to some of these years and see how quickly these things go. Okay, well, the first thing you need to know is this is where Alexander the Great was born. Uh, this is July 356 B.C., okay? This is probably the most important battle that he ever fought because it proved his military prowess. This is the Battle of Granicus, okay? This was Greeks and Macedonians versus Persians as he crosses the Hellespont and decides enough of this stuff fighting over in our territory, I'm going to take the fight to you. So beginning here, this is 334 B.C. And remember in B.C. we count down, okay? You're not counting up like, you know, next year here will be 2024. You know, this is counting down. So this is 334. Some people actually date the uh, beginning of the Greek Empire to 334. Most, uh, however, say 331. So here he is. 334 B.C. right here. This is the siege of Miletus, okay, that also happens in 334, okay? This is the Battle of Isis, not Isis as in I-S-I-S, it's I-S-S-U-S, -S -S okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this also happens in 334 B.C. And then he drops down here to, to, to the number five here. Anybody have a, any guess as to what this might be? This is, the, this is the famous siege in the Battle of Tyre, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that, but not too much. Guess when this happened? 334 B.C. 334 B.C., 344, 344 B.C. Look how quickly this dude is moving. The siege of Gaza, okay, is actually a couple years later in 332 B.C. The founding of Alexandria here in Egypt, the famed city of Alexandria, the, the libraries, and things of that nature. Uh, that happens in 331 B.C. Now, at 331 B.C., after the founding here, Alexander goes right back up here to the Tyre area, okay? And this is, the, this is I think, the quintessential battle, the Battle of Gaugamela, which is the de deciding battle between the Persians and the Greek Macedonians. This is when you can absolutely say that, that, uh, uh, that, that Greece has taken over this entire area Alexander is proclaimed uh, king of Persia and so on and so forth. This is also in 331 B.C. You have the battle of the, of the um, uh, Axiom Defile here in 331 B.C. He's moving. This is December, 331 B.C. Okay, battle of the Persian Gate is in 330 B.C. Okay, and now he begins an eastern campaign over here, the battle of Cryopolis in 329 B.C., the, the Copton campaign here happens in 327 B.C. The Battle of the Hyaxapes happens in 326 B.C. He begins a, um, uh, an assault on the Punjab uh, here in, that would be 326 down to 325 B.C. And then 15, sitting right here in the middle, is Alexander the Great. That's when he died. Where he died, that is Babylon, and that is 323 B.C. But you can see... Here, to here, to here, to here, to here, okay, to here, three years. That's fast. That'd be fast in today's military campaigns. That's how fast this dude was moving with his Macedonian army of 50,000 through this area, okay? That is quick, and that's exactly what Scripture had prophesied. So he has aligned the Grecian city-states, okay? They're all aligned, okay? 
Nobody wants to have the outcome that Thebes had, okay? And so he goes across, sets his sights abroad, says, we're taking the fight to you. Enough of this stuff about you Persians coming over here and attacking our mainland. We're going to take it to you. And he comes to all these cities masquerading. I say masquerading. That's a little bit of a political statement. He claims to be a liberator, okay, not a conqueror. Well, by the way, folks, you can be both a liberator and a conqueror. And he, was, and he was doing both, okay? So I told you about crossing over uh, the Hellespont into, into Turkey and, and the Battle of Granicus. That was a major win. That showed that the Greeks could beat the Persians on Persian territory, by the way. It was a, a great win for Alexander. It actually demonstrated and consolidated his power among the generals because up at this point, people were still, you know, is this young kid going to be that good? as a leader, and they saw, wow, he, he, you know, he knocked down the Persians. It was not a decisive battle, okay, but the decisive cavalry charge that was done there was led by one of his generals by the name of Ptolemy, which you'd almost, if you're reading it, you'd say Ptolemy. starts with a P. So that's where the, we first see the general Ptolemy, okay, is at the Battle of the River Granicus. The Battle of Isis that happened you know, uh, really just about a year after that, the Persians had, had now kind of uh, retreated, and they were going to try to cut off the supply lines of Alexander the Great. Okay, One thing about Alexander the Great, he didn't move with a massive army. He moved with 50,000 or so. You know, historians are a little bit split on that, but he didn't try to bring the hordes of, of Europe against, against Asia. He, he was very quick, okay? So he was, you know, bringing a small group, and so the... Um, the Persians tried to cut off his supply lines, but they misjudged where his supply lines were. They set up in battle arraignment on territory that was not advantageous to their numerical advantage, which was about, according to historians, 7 to 1 to 10 to 1. Okay, They set up on a, a, a pretty narrow piece of land, which when you're narrowed like that and only a few people can come through at any given time, your numerical advantages d uh, disappear rather quickly. And so... The Battle of Isis was was fairly decisive, but it was not, um, it, you know, it was not the one that I think actually ended the Persian Empire. If you see, uh, at this battle, this is kind of neat to know. Uh, the Invincibles have you an auditory? Uh, I don't know uh, if did, were the Invincibles mentioned in the in the movies that have been made about that. Yeah, the Invincibles were ten thousand Persians, okay, and they called them the Invincibles not because they wouldn't die but because there was an agreement that whenever one fell, the family would su supply another. So there was always 10,000 of them, okay? Until I guess the family got, you know, <laughs> got depleted. Uh, but uh, they were called the Invincibles, um, and they were defeated there at the Battle of Isis. This is where Alexander drew up his really famous military strategy, and uh, you could call it unfortunate for me, but I actually studied history under... Uh, some um, uh, military historians, the type that would get called back into the, uh, the Pentagon whenever we went to war to preserve historical documents. So I've had to do a little bit more, I've had to do a lot more study of military tactics than, than, than you would think and, I, and, the, the, and certainly than I appreciated. Uh, but uh, it's tough. But this is where uh, Alexander developed his military tactic of feinting, okay, a, 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 a flank weakness drawing the enemy off to the flank side, and once they turned their formation, he would drive a cavalry charge right through the middle of them and then be able to, to, to take them by a pincer maneuver. It was something he did time and time and time again, and the Persians didn't learn, okay? And when they didn't learn, they ended up falling to him. So that's where he had his, you know, his, he, 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 he put some, he, he made them think that, that his flank was falling over here, made them, first of all, think that the flank was the center of his line, made them think that it was falling, and then they'd throw their reserve units at that, and then once they did that, they return, he drives his cavalry charge straight into the middle of them, and now he split their forces. Speed and deception were what Alexander used. At Isis, at the Battle of Isis, Alexander himself led the famous cavalry charge. That would have been his, what they called the companion Calvary, his elite units. So instead of, after ISIS, instead of heading for the kill shot, okay, because now he's got the Persians really on the run. They're in full-on retreat. But he decides, I'm going to consolidate my power before I decide to go marching on in, you know, to, to Persia and Elam and places like that. 
So instead, he drops down the side of the Mediterranean Sea and lays siege to, to the city of Tyre, okay? By capturing Tyre, he actually begins to have a, a stranglehold on the, the commercial uh, aspects of the Persian Empire because that was a massive trading and banking center to the extent that it, it wouldn't be modern banking, but that's where a tremendous amount of commerce went through. Now, uh, Bill and I have actually talked about this. Uh, if you want to see some amazing prof prophecy re that has come true in history, you need to look no further than one of Daniel's contemporaries, Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 26, it talks about the destruction of Tyre and says many nations will come upon it. And in fact, Nebuchadnezzar came upon it. And in fact, the Persians came upon it. And in fact, now we see Alexander the Great okay, come upon it. And so the th interesting thing about the city of Tyre, it was actually two cities. You had a city off the, inland, off the coast, meaning out on an island, and then you had the city that was a portion of the old town that was actually on the island. Then, you know, it had the big walls and stuff like that, like you would see at any type of, you know, fortress city, okay? And in Ezekiel's prophecy, it prophesied that your stones will be taken down and thrown into the sea. You know what Alexander did? Took their walls down, threw it into the sea, and made a bridge to get out to the island, okay? He took the whole thing, okay? And that's what Alexander did at Tyre. So he drops down, you know, and, and, and takes Tyre, and he goes on and lays siege to Gaza, okay? Um, then um, uh, Egypt decides that... <laughs> And if, if, if Egypt decides it's going to be smart, is what it is. Egypt says, whoa, we give. In fact, come on in here. We're going to build a massive city and name it after you. <laughs> okay? So Egypt gets smart, right? They peacefully surrender, okay? And that's when Alexandria, that great city, uh, was founded. Then Alexander decides it's time probably at this point that we need to go ahead and, 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 and see what we can do towards the east. All of this time, by the way, Darius has been sending diplomatic envoys to Alexander. Okay, After the Battle of Isis, he continually sends at least three outreaches, you know, saying, uh, why don't you just stay right over here and we're going to be okay over here? And, and Alexander's like, I'm not having anything of this. And so D Darius figures, we're going to have to fight this out again. And he actually takes his massive army now to Gargamela, uh, which is G-A-U-G-A-M-E-L-A, -E over in uh, the, uh, the, the eastern portion of, um, uh, of what we would consider Turkey. Okay, Darius got there first, chose his ground, and even leveled the ground. Okay. Went out, had his engineers level the ground so that the mighty uh, Persian uh, Scythian chariots could be uh, deployed against the hoplite phalanxes and things of that nature. So he chose his ground. He manicured his ground, okay? He was fighting exactly where he wanted to fight, an open plain, okay, instead of a narrow little inlet or anything like that. But what did Alexander do? The same thing he did at Isis. On the right flank, okay, he sent troops, some troops over there. Uh, I, some people say 2,000, others say a little bit more than that, to try to, because he started to basically withdraw that flank back, sent more troops over there to make the Persians think that's their weakness. We can get there this time. We didn't do it at ISIS, but this time it's going to work. And so Darius throws his reserve units in, and they head after that right flank, and as soon as they turn that you know, turn over to that right flank, drives another cavalry charge right into the middle of the Persians, and the Battle of Gagamela is decisive for Alexander. And at this point, Alexander's named king of Persia, and he, he's basically got it all. This is a tactic called the pawn sacrifice, okay? That's what, the, that's what Alexander was famous for, the pawn sacrifice. He had no problems sacrificing some of his troops for the greater good of the victory, you know, in, in the battle, okay? And that's exactly what's happening. By the way, it's also a 2014 movie about Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky because the pawn sacrifice is also a famous maneuver in chess, okay? It's 
where you get it from. So now Alexander is considered the king of all the Medo-Persian Empire, okay, after the Battle of Gaugamela, okay, plus some, and he eventually begins to turn his attentions towards India. Now, Persia tried to do that too to, to poor effect. Okay, and actually Alexander was a little bit more effective at it, but not a whole lot because he didn't take it either. But he would eventually die in Babylon, as I mentioned, in 323 B.C. And he would die airless. There was no succession plan in place. No, none whatsoever. So, and we're going we're gonna to read the, the remainder of the scripture here, and you're going to see this. Dr. Wolverd says, expositors, both liberal and conservative, have interpret, interpreted this as representing the untimely death of Alexander and the division of his empire into four major sections. Alexander, who had conquered more of the world than any previous ruler, was not able to conquer himself. Partly due to strenuous exertion, his dissipated life, and a raging fever, Alexander died in a drunken debauchery in Babylon. Just about 33 years of age, his death left a great conquest without an effective single leader, and it took about 20 years for the empire to be successfully divided. And that's what we see here when it, we talk about dividing it into four, uh, four parts. Dr. Criswell says, No more remarkable or accurate prediction could have ever been imagined than this detailed analysis of the Grecian empire. So let's look at this, okay? So the, 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 goat, has, has the, the goat with the big horn has you know gone across the face of the earth almost you know not touching the ground okay in verse 8 it says then the male goat magnified himself accordingly but as soon as he was mighty a large horn was broken as soon as alexander got all this stuff he he goes down and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven out of one of them came forth a rather small horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south towards the east and towards the beautiful land it grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to earth and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host and it removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down and on account of transgression the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and it will prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Let's back it up and let's go to the, uh, the four horns that, that appear. Okay? And if you look at the historical division of Alexander's uh, empire, once he's gone, okay, there is, some people say 20, I think it's more like 40 years of infighting among these generals to figure out who's going to have what territory, who's going to rule. And so, Blake, if you want to put the next slide up here, make sure I can get this right. Here's your four divisions of the Grecian empire, okay? Uh, down here, this would be Egypt, a little bit of Libya, and you can also see here, uh, uh, this, is, this is actually, in this division, you would have uh, Israel, if you will, in here. Um, but this would be the Ptolemies, the Ptolemies, okay? That would be the area that, um, that Ptolemy would have. This whole area to the east, okay, including the southern portion of Turkey and whatnot, all the way over here into Afghanistan and whatnot, this would be the Seleucids, Seleucus, okay? Up here in the purple is Lysimachus, okay? That's the general Lysimachus, and we'll talk a little bit about him. And then over here, I don't know what color you want to call that, red, fuchsia, pink, I don't know, uh, but that's Cassander, okay, who takes the, what we generally consider to be the homeland of Greece. So those are your four divisions that appear after Alexander's death, okay? And it takes a long time to figure this out. And I also want you to know that most, most students of history do not like to study this part of history at all because it is chaos, complete chaos. And then so-and-so who has the same name of the other so-and-so killed the so-and-so, okay, and set himself up as a ruler of so-and-so or such and such place, and that lasted for seven months, 
Okay, and then it goes over and gets conquered again. And right now, actually, the beautiful land, as you heard in, in the prophecy, uh, the, the land of Israel, uh, the covenant land, it's like a ping pong ball going back and forth between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, back and forth, back and forth. And isn't that kind of what Israel has been? Okay, and what it will be? Okay, when you start talking about the, 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 the Megiddo Valley and things of that nature? So you have Ptolemy, okay, his capital would have been in Alexandria, okay, he would have been, you know, uh, I'll, I'll call him pretty Greek, okay, he wasn't as Greek as the Seleucids though, the, the Seleucids were the most uh, heavily of the, those that were not proximate to actual Greece uh, in terms of being Hellenized, so Seleucids would have had Syria, Babylonia, east all the way over there towards India, uh, major city for the Seleucid Empire would have been Antioch. And that's going to come back into play here really, really quickly. In the north, you had Lysimachus, okay? Uh, that would have been the one in purple, okay? Um, he was actually Alexander the Great's bodyguard, okay? He was, here's, here's some examples. He was killed in 281 B.C. by Seleucus, and then Seleucus is killed by Ptolemy, okay? You see why you didn't want to study this? You had to have so many flashcards to figure this stuff out. His major city was Pella, and he also founded... <laughs> A town called Lysimachia. Of course, why not? You get an Alexandria, I get a Lysimachia. Okay? So we're waiting for a Greg. We need a town called Greg. Or Smyrtus. I'm still, t I'm going to convince Brandis to name her baby Smyrtus. <laughs> I'm making a mission. In the west, you had Cassander, okay? In that pink or fuchsia, okay? That's Macedonia, southern Greece, all right? Now, he killed Alexander's uh, son, Alexander IV, along with Alexander's mother. Yeah, gentle guy here, all right? And he killed most of Alexander's blood relatives that he could find, okay? He marries Alexander's sister. Maybe she was pretty. I don't know. But he didn't kill her. He marries Alexander's sister. You know what her name was? This is a cool one. Thessalonica. Thessalonica. So there's a town found at this time called Thessalonica, and we would eventually see that as one of uh, a couple of the letters, okay, that are written. And he decides he's going to rebuild Thebes, <laughs> and, he, and he does that. So there's your four uh, divisions of Alexander's kingdom. And you'll notice it's already said that Alexander magnifies himself, we saw in the Persian Empire that their kings magnified themselves. And then there's this, this rather small horn. Some of your translations may say little horn. Um, and it says very clearly that it magnifies itself. So I want to spend just a little bit of time on this concept of magnification because I think it's pretty much the theme that we can take away from this. I mean, obviously there's historical you know, prophecy that's been fulfilled, but I want to spend a little bit of time on magnification because the, the Bible speaks a lot to the idea of magnify or to exalt. The word here in Greek is gadol, okay? That's the word, okay? Magnify, to become great or to grow, not in number, not like, you know, how many uh, progeny you have or anything like that, but in importance, greatness. The concept here of, is preeminence. And you'll see all through the Daniel chapter 8, you hear about these, these, these kings, these, these empires magnifying themselves. Well, magnification belongs to God and God alone. Okay? This is where the whole thing about a jealous God, you know, comes into play. We have seen and we continue to see nations and individuals who magnify themselves. And I would argue that every time we adopt an attitude of, I don't need God, I can do this under my own skill, we're magnifying ourselves. Every time we disobey what we know to be God's path for us, God's will for us, we're magnifying ourselves. So it's a little introspective as well. And we're going to see more of this as we traverse through the last few chapters of entities, people, nations that magnifies themselves. In particular, we're going to see an, a, a, a prototype of Antichrist, okay? So what does the Old Testament have to say about 
magnification or exalting, okay? Ezekiel 38, verse 23, this is a contemporary uh, 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 prophet to Daniel um, talking about the big time, end times invasion of Jerusalem. It says, Ezekiel 38, 23, I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am Lord. If people are going to profess ignorance, I guess that's their right. But there will come a time when all will know that God is God. And he says that he's going to cause that to come about himself. The psalmist in chapter 35, verse 27 says, Let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication. And let them say continually, The Lord be magnified who delights in the prosperity of his servant. It is the Lord who is to be magnified. The psalmist says five chapters later in chapter 40, verse 16, let all who seek you rejoice, you being God, let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Magnification is something that is due God, never due man. 2 Samuel, okay, chapter 7, verse 25. This is the chapter that talks about David wanting to build a temple to God. Say, you know, he goes to Nathan and says, I'm going I'm to build this temple. Let's build a temple. Nathan says, that's cool. God says, uh, you didn't consult me first, right? All right. Verse 25 of 2 Samuel 7 says, Now therefore, O Lord God, the word you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken, that your name may be magnified forever by saying the Lord of hosts is God over Israel and may the house of your servant David be established before you. So David is, he, what, he's, what I see this scripture saying is David has the best intentions. He wants to build, he, he's living in a palace, okay? Uh, certainly a palace as distinct from the tent, you know, of, 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 of worship that, that supposedly was God's house at the time. He sees this disparity, and he wants to magnify God, okay? That's a noble intention. The problem is he didn't seek God's counsel for it, right? And God says, no, you're a man of war, Okay? You're not building it. Your son will build it. He will be a man of peace, okay? So even our intentions don't really matter, okay? Great intentions, right? It's the God will be magnified because it is due him. Our well-intentioned plans are insufficient, okay? Isaiah chapter 10, verse 15 says, and this is the prophecy of doom for Assyria, Okay, just so you get an idea where this is coming from. This is where Isaiah is prophesying that Assyria is going to go down. Is the axe to boast itself over the ones who chops it? Think about it. Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops it? In other words, who deserves to be magnified? The axe or the axeman? Okay. Who is skilled? The axe or the axeman? Okay. Is the saw to exalt it over itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it, or like a rod lifting him who is not wood. Nothing we can do. Nothing we can do is deserving of magnification. He's the potter, we're the clay. But you say, that's Old Testament stuff. Well, let's get to the New Testament. James 4, 6, you knew this was probably coming. But he gives a greater peace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. So if you need some New Testament validation, you, 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 you've got that. If God has great empires under his command, and he's going to use this fauda, this chaos, which is chaos to us, but complete order to him, okay? Think about the plans he has for our lives. Think about the plans he has for you and to me, okay? But that's not from Jesus. You got, you got Old Testament, you got prophecy, you got New Testament, but that's not from Jesus. Matthew 23, 12, prior to the listing of the eight woes against the Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites, Matthew 23, 12, this is Jesus. 
Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. There's your concept of magnification. Okay? And we see it all through Daniel chapter 8. Those that exalt themselves go down, and they go down in flames. Okay? So let's turn our attention back to a character in Daniel chapter 8 who most certainly magnified himself. Verse 9 says, Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn. Some of your translations may say little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, towards a beautiful land. It grew up the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. Who's the commander of the host? That's God. That's God. So whoever this cat is, is going to magnify himself to the point that he's claiming to be equal with God. Remove the regular sacrifice from him, meaning from God, okay? And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. He's going to defile the sanctuary. And on account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice. It will fling truth to the ground. It will perform its will, and it will prosper. Now, when you see prosper there, that just means its intentions are being fulfilled. He had malevolent intentions, and it's going to be fulfilled. It's going to happen, okay? But in verse 13, my translation says then. I would like to use the word but here, but that's all right. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, okay, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Clarify. This is not the little horn that we saw in Daniel 7. That was the Antichrist. That was very, very clear. And we know this for several reasons, that these are not the same. Although I believe the one we are seeing here is prototypical of the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 7, the little horn that nudges out the others comes from the fourth kingdom of Rome. This one comes out of the division of the Grecian Empire. The little horn of Daniel 7 comes up among ten horns, right? This one comes up from among four, but really within one of those four. The little horn of Daniel is given 3.5 years, time, times, and half a time, to do his malevolent will, okay? This little horn is given 2,300 days, which is over six years. There's different timetable here. The kingdom of Christ comes after that little horn of Daniel chapter 7. The Antichrist is, 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 is vanquished, okay? The fourth kingdom, Rome, comes after this particular little horn in Daniel chapter 8 is vanquished. That said, there can be very little doubt. In fact, it is very clear that there are similarities galore between this referenced individual in Daniel chapter 8 and the Antichrist that, was still, that is still to come. Chief among their similarities is they set themselves up against Israel, they set themselves up against the Jews, and they magnify themselves and commit horrible atrocities. So who is this guy? Almost all, almost all commentators agree. You are looking at the eighth king of the Seleucid region of Greece, a fellow by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, that's who you're looking at here. Almost everybody agrees. Remember I told you that in the Seleucid kingdom that one of their major cities was Antioch? Okay, so here you have Antiochus Epiphanes. See, the Seleucids, I told you, you know, kind of Israel had gone back and forth between the Ptolemies and the, and the Seleucids. Um, well, Palestine uh, is now under the control of, at this point in, in history of the Seleucids, and they were very, 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 very Greek very Greek, Hellenistic, much more so than the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies generally, and neither did the Seleucids, by the way, they generally did not mess with other people's religions. They generally left them alone, but not Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, Epiphanes means manifest, conspicuous, or illustrious. The Jews would come up mocking his name, however, calling him Antiochus Epimenes, which means Antiochus the madman, okay? That probably didn't make him very happy. I don't know, maybe it did make him happy. I don't know. Um, he is of Grecian descent, 
most likely he would have been Syrian, and he was born about 215 B.C. and died in 164 B.C. He ruled from 175 B.C. to 164 B.C. Something to note here is you're now in the intertestinal period of history. Old Testament canon is done. And then there's about 400 years before you pick up in the New Testament. So you are now in that in-between portion of history, okay, that we don't see, uh, we only see references of in Scripture, but not true descriptions, okay? He is an illegitimate ruler. The ruler at this time should have been a fellow by the name of Demetrius, okay, which would also, by the way, been in the lineage of Alexander. But Demetrius was a political prisoner in Rome, and actually, Antiochus Epiphanes has also been a, a, a prisoner in Rome. But since A.E., I'll just call him A.E., was out, okay, he claimed the, and designated himself co-regent. You know, he, he claimed the throne, des, designated himself as co-regent with the infant son of the prior king. Now, what do you think is going to happen to this infant son of the prior king? Any guesses? He ain't going to see adolescence. Let's just say that, okay? So now Antiochus Epiphanes is on the throne of the Seleucid kingdom. He signs a peace treaty with Rome, okay? Because now you're in the days of the Roman Senate, okay? And Rome is starting to get a little bit frisky, if you will. And he signs a peace treaty with Rome, okay? Um, and <laughs> decides that, since I've already got this Israel place, I think I'm going to go ahead and go take all of Egypt. So he goes down to Egypt, okay, and he starts to uh, try to consolidate power there for the Seleucids uh, in Egypt, and he encounters uh, a, a council to the Roman Senate, a guy by the name of Gaius Popolilius Laenus, okay? And I'm going to offend some Texans here, and I apologize, but I am a Texan. Because this Roman consul told Antiochus to get out. Rome says you can't have this. And so this elder statesman of Rome draws a circle in the sand around Antiochus Epiphanes. See where I'm going with this? He draws a circle and he says, before you leave this circle... Give me a reply that I can take back to the Roman Senate. In other words, you're going to give me the answer of your intention before you cross this line. Now, I say it could antagonize some Texans because do I believe that Travis did this at the Alamo, drew the line in the sand? This is where the phrase, the line in the sand, actually comes from. Okay? And Antiochus says, yeah, I don't think I'm going to bring down Rome. Those legions are looking a little tough, you know, at this point. So I'm going to leave Egypt. But while he was in Egypt, the people back in Judah, in, in Jerusalem, he's gone so long, they think he's dead. They think he's dead. So now you get some folks trying to jockey for position there. Well, he ain't dead. He's just in a circle, okay? He tells them, no, we're not going to attack, and now I'm going, I'm going back, okay? And he finds, you know, Jerusalem in, in, in an uproar, okay? I'm going to try to knock a few of these off, and I really don't want to. Yeah, I'm not going to do I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I really don't want to do this next week, but I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to list for you next week some of the antics and atrocities that Antiochus Epiphanes did among the Jewish population. And I'd mentioned, I think, to Amber a little earlier, I was hoping that we we would not have any of the youth in here uh, today because it is grotesque and it is barbaric, but I think you need to hear it, okay? I think you need to hear it because with Antiochus Epiphanes being a prelude, a prototype, a metaphor, if you will, to Antichrist and realizing that this cat, as bad as he was, is going to pale in comparison to how bad Antichrist will be during the period of the Great Tribulation, you're... I think you'll see very quickly how much worse could it get. And I don't even want to imagine, but the Apostle John didn't have to imagine. He describes it for you in the book of Revelation. So we'll very quickly go over those, uh, but it is awful. 
It is awful what this did. This dude did. Okay, but we're going to come out on the backside. I want to don't want to leave you in completely bad news. We're going to come out on the backside because when the temple is restored, okay, after what he did there, we get a festival from that. Did you know that? You 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 get a feast. You get you get a celebration. You know what that is? Anybody got? It's where Hanukkah. This is where Hanukkah comes from, okay? So it's going to be awful, and then you're going to get a celebration, uh, and, 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 and you're, you're, as you can see here, you're winding real close now to, to, uh, to that glorious day in, in Bethlehem, okay? You're getting real close in, in history uh, to this because we're, we're in the second century B.C. right now, and, and it's not far to, to run up into to, to the time when, when, uh, when, when uh, Mary and Joseph... Uh, make their taxation journey, and um, and the God Man, our Savior, comes. Any questions about this? Wanted to get a little further uh, than this today, but yeah, Chip. Yeah. Actually, no. I do, I don't think that it's 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 a possibility. I think we're actually going to hear God speak in, in a moment, but on that one, I think you're looking at two angels, and the reason I think that is because obviously one of them didn't know the answer, okay? They were, yeah. The, the, he doesn't know, he doesn't know about the, the, the end of time when the, when that title deed is going to be, you know, the, the, the exact time, that's correct, but in this case, I think when you're talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, I think, I think you're talking about angels, but I do think it's a good, interesting point to bring up, is that the angels seem to be concerned about what's going on on earth, you know, they have curiosities about what's going on here, and isn't that cool? that you've got angelic beings that are interested in the affairs of men and women, I think that's, that's really, really cool. The other thing to note about that is that's a part of his vision, right? That's a part of his vision. They're not talking to him right now. They're talking amongst them, th themselves, and he's like a, a fly on the wall, if you will, and hears them talking. But I do think we're going to hear God's voice in a little later portion of the, of, of the Scripture. I absolutely do. Yours is a possibility for sure. I mean, that, if, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are magnified, Lord. Forgive us when we magnify ourselves, at, which I do way, way too often. Forgive me when I rely on my skills, my knowledge, my abilities, realizing that all of these, all of these are grace gifts from you, Lord. Magnify yourself in me, magnify yourself in, in your children here, Lord, that we might be salt into this earth, Lord, that, that all may know that Jesus Christ is the Savior. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.